as we get ready now to uh, move into our next panel discussion. For what we will be discussing as highlighted, this pay, this pay, does paint the picture in terms of education and how best we can uh, advance and explore on the opportunities that exist. But most importantly, this also speaks to the collaborative efforts that do need to take place. Now, my panelists will be joining us and many of them represent different stakeholders everyone from government, the private sector, NPOs, as well as innovators within the education space to really help us understand how it is that we can leapfrog, continue to progress, collaborate even further and deepen the levels of access to education for all South Africans. Now, we'll be joined by some of our panelists in just a moment. However, I do want you to keep the feedback going as well as paying attention to this particular conversation as just before we break away for lunch, we'll be picking your brain and giving away some prizes to you uh, to follow up on some of the trends and key highlights that you've paid attention to in terms of themes that have been brought up during this particular panel discussion and earlier sessions that have been held today. Now, as we uh, get ready for our conversation, now you can appreciate that we're living in a digital age, right? And that does mean that you're not presently with us at a conference, but we are coming to you live using a particular technology tool and platform. And for all of us, 2020 has been the year of you're on mute. Can you see my screen? <laughs> and of course, uh, ensuring that uh, there are minimal technical disruptions. But even though that might take place in the background, it will ensure that it does not disrupt the quality of our broadcast as well as content of our conversation for today. So with that being said, we are still ensuring that we have a few more of our guests who will be joining us. However, I think it's fair that we get the ball rolling as well as uh, perhaps uh, intriguing your interest by uh, pulling in two of our guests who are going to join us now to deep dive into this particular conversation in terms of understanding how it is that their respective organizations and the portfolios that they cover enhance the access to education that is so greatly required in South Africa. I'd like to start with our first guest who is joining us uh, digitally uh, uh, through a, a platform where we'll be able to interact with her, Vuiswa Ngonza. She's the CEO of Bridge. And in studio next to me, I've got Kulula Manona, who's the Director of Reading Promotion at the National Department of Basic Education. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for your time uh, and conversation that you'll be participating with us today. Kulula, I'll take the liberty of starting with you because you are present with me here in studio today. Again, to our audience, we have ensured that we have uh, obliged with all the protocol regarding COVID-19 regulations. So trust that uh, appropriate social distancing and hand sanitizing has taken place before we made our way onto stage today. But from healthcare to education, and I want to come to you, Kulula, to really get a sense and an understanding um, as you open up this conversation for us regarding the state of education in South Africa pre-lockdown. Perhaps if you could take us in, in terms of understanding what the landscape looked like, like, looked like and how that was radically challenged um, by the subsequent lockdown that was implemented. Um, thank you for that question, Gugu. And, um I do want to say that we had actually gotten ourselves to a space where we were seeing real gains. Mm. Real gains in terms of the services that we deliver, real gains in terms of the collaboration efforts that we have actually been embarking on. So we've been journeying with, with a lot of partners in, in, in business, in, in society at large, and all of those efforts were really coming to pay off. We were at a state where we were able to confidently say that our children are at school and there's a teacher in front of the children and they're gainfully engaged. Mm. And uh, we were at a point where we were saying that when it comes to the professional development of our teachers, uh, where they would be required to possess competences, to be able to teach. Uh, we, we, we had actually walked a long way uh, in, in providing them with opportunities to grow those competences. We had uh, implemented initiatives that had been tested uh, prior to them being implemented. We, we were looking at initiatives like um, how to strengthen early grade reading, early grade counting and early grade writing. Mm. And uh, because we work in a sector where there is a lot of collaboration and, and, and a lot of expertise that lies even outside of the department, we have had the goodwill of South Africans who had uh, said, yes, we will do the testing. You are a big system, implement and scale. Mm -hmm. we, we 
a, a job, we are innovators, a job, we are in business, we can provide you with the necessary uh, funding support and the innovators would say, well, let's take this concept, let's test it and uh, let's see if it can really introduce um, 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 education reform as you would want to see it. And so we were at a happy space. Sure. There comes COVID. Yep. There comes COVID and, and it's really threatening to, to, to disrupt uh, uh, that. We know that one of the major issues that we have um, as a country, particularly if you look at early grade literacy, uh, is that perhaps we, we, we are in a country where there is serious challenges when it comes to education in formative years. Mm -hmm. And we can never overemphasize the importance of literacy development in the formative years. Uh, because now we do know that we accept children in the schooling system who exhibit some gaps and some deficits. Yes. And uh, there's, there's enough body of research that shows us that our learners come from homes uh, that do not have access to texts, access to stimulating and exciting um, uh, reading books, mm. uh, particularly in the languages of those learners. And we know the majority of the learners speak their own home in many cases African languages yes. and now it is also known that children learn to read by being exposed to reading material it's that exposure and that interaction that actually helps them to make meaning exactly. with what they read and now getting into a school a system as big as ours carrying those deficits it then needs that when they get to that school they must find teachers who are competent who will be able to model reading model counting, model for them how to make meaning with texts. And when they get to school, if we are saying they are coming from communities that do not have access to books, mm -hmm. we must provide them exactly. with books when they get to school. I want to tie this to Sis Fuyiswa in a moment, but I do want to come to you because uh, um, what we've witnessed during the lockdown is the, the fact that there has been a lack of stimulation for many uh, pupils within the public schooling environment, particularly to read. Netflix and chill has become uh, uh, the slogan of the day yes. when it comes to spending leisurely time at yes. home and not necessarily being productive. How is it that we need to source solutions and innovations to change this? Uh, are there conversations that you as a department are engaging into to understand and identify how this element in terms of education actually has dire consequences in terms yes. of uh, the social construct that we're living in? It does. It does. And, and, and um, COVID has been a big eye-opener for us as a department with our constitutional mandate to lead in the space. It has been a huge eye-opener for South Africans at large mm. uh, because now we found ourselves in a space where children spend more time at home than they did at school. Yes. And, and, and so our education system has been designed uh, to provide that support in that kind of a social manner where children are at school, uh, in classroom support. Now the gap was really, really, really wide when we had to think on our feet, how do we support the children who are at home? Mm. How do we ensure that the fact that they're at home shouldn't mean that reading stops? Yes. And, and it really points to one of the elements that need to be strengthened from today going forward, which is family literacy. Yes. Uh, because if we had a very, very, very strong base in terms of family literacy, then we would have then felt a bit relieved to know that then our children are still continuing to read. Yes, we then had uh, to, to, to kind of embark on efforts of strengthening communication between the schools and the, and, and the homes uh, using uh, platforms of, of technology, using mm -hmm. WhatsApp, using Facebook, whichever that was actually uh, available to be used to communicate with parents to say that parents, you have the children with you, please ensure that you read to the child ensure that your homes are hubs of storytelling. You, and, and that's one of the things that I think we want to really bring to the attention of, of parents. Yes. That agency, that knowledge, that empowerment, that as a parent, even if you didn't go to school, there's a richness within you that you can actually share, that can shape and, and, and inform educational experiences for your child. Stories. Exactly. Stories, they are here. 
And those are the conversations we need to continue having. And those are the conversations that we think can actually be facilitated by collaboration. Exactly. I'm glad you highlight the family literacy element because it does speak to a, a broader challenge that we need to address and soliciting some solutions from various stakeholders. Absolutely. Indeed. Sisfuyu, so I'd like to come to you now addressing our question to you as you join us virtually. We also joined by Usis Kangisa Diamond as well, uh, um, representing uh, Old Mutual, uh, to give us some feedback in terms of uh, how this does develop and, and change and transcend. But this for you, so let me start off with you. I think we've already painted the landscape in terms of what the environment looked like pre-COVID and now that we are living in times of COVID. But I'm keen to understand what you've also highlighted and uh, identified as key barriers to quality education and how best we need to actually manage these, given that they've really been brought to the fore in light of the lockdown. Um, thank you, Gobu. Um, for me, the report that really resonates with me and where we at as a country is a synthesis report that came out uh, in 2016 from researchers in Stellenbosch. And they categorized the barriers as binding constraints, but there were many two areas where they categorized um, our barriers. And if we are to change uh, educational outcomes and have traction, we would have to address two big issues, which continue to beset our education system. The first one is lack of accountability at all levels. The second one is lack of capacity, again, at many levels. So they went further to dig deep into the four barriers what they called binding constraints. Um, the first one is that we're dealing with a, a weak uh, functional, a weak institutional functionality. So you have nine provinces that are responsible for implementing and delivering curriculum, but there are huge variances because the interpretation is not the same and the resourcing is not the same. The second barrier is that of undue union influence. In strong democracies, unions are valued and they have a, 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 a strong critical role to play. But in many instances, and certainly in South Africa, oftentimes our unions don't always act in the best interest of children. Hmm. And it's very difficult to get rid of teachers who shouldn't be teaching. The third barrier for, uh, for me and from that report is the fact that it was highlighted that many of our teachers don't have a strong uh, knowledge, content knowledge or pedagogical skills, which speaks to how we recruit, how we support and how we nurture our teachers. The last area, which is a huge barrier, is the fact that even when children are at school, there's no guarantee of the quality of teaching and learning they get when they're there. And all these barriers were there before COVID-19 and they've just been exas exacerbated now. You will also remember that um, to observe social distance, the schools are now rotating. So children aren't at school every day and they're there for less time. And even at the best of times, they weren't necessarily getting quality teaching while they were at school. So those uh, opportunities to learn continue to be lost. And at least six months of this year, children were not learning effectively. And I think we were caught napping and we are not unique as South Africa in the sense that the way education has engaged parents hasn't been um, forward thinking which now means that there is an opportunity for our schools to engage parents and caregivers differently and to make sure that uh, schools communicate with parents. And I mean, for all those of us whose parents might have been active in our education, you know, when you know that your teacher is in contact or speaks regularly with your folks, you tend to, to uh, behave differently. You don't want to disappoint. So it sort of like keeps you, um, it, it keeps you wanting not to disappoint and wanting to do the right things. 
So while it's, um, it's, the effects of COVID-19 have been devastating, they are providing opportunities to do things differently and engage parents, not just when kids are naughty, but also to report back when kids have um, had major successes so that you're not only engaging. I mean, no parent will be called to school to always be told that your child is, is not behaving and doesn't belong here. Certainly. So as sorry, as a private sector, as civil society and as government, we need to do collaborative partnerships to drive educational change. Thank you so much for sharing those uh, initial thoughts with us, Sisfuya. So we really do appreciate it. And we are painting a landscape in terms of getting the, the overview and the gist of the conversation from each of our panelists who are joining us. You might be mindful of the fact uh, that Kayaga Zinamfu of uh, Public Schools Partnership was meant to join us. However, due to some technical challenges, we do continue with the conversation, but we'll be sure to on, uh, ensure that there's ongoing engagement with all our various stakeholders in the upcoming sessions. Another guest who is joining us virtually is Kangisa Diamond. She's the Head of Education at the Old Mutual Foundation. Kangisa, great to have you with us, and uh, thank goodness technology has pulled through for us this morning. <laughs> I, I, I'm intrigued to get your opening remarks. Uh, as we've heard from your peers on the panel, uh, essentially we were caught sna napping. Uh, uh, whilst we were trying to make certain levels of progress in education, we have uh, seen our weaknesses being brought to the fore on the back of COVID-19 as well as the lockdown. As a corporate representative, though, how do you uh, um, evaluate uh, the standing in terms of education and the support, perhaps, that corporates such as the Old Mutual Foundation have contributed in terms of uh, hopefully alleviating some of these challenges we see in the education space? Um, thank you. Thank you, Gugu. I think um, what we've already heard uh, uh, from, from Kathy as well as Dr. Rampele um, and how we've introduced this session actually is that um, education receives significant funding both from the private sector as well as the public sector. And yet continuously we continue to see poor, poor outcomes. Um, and so with COVID-19, which has ravaged an economy that was already on a lifeline, we are likely to see a reduction in funding for education, um, both from government and from the private sector. And, and that is worrying. Um, the question therefore for me is, given what we've seen in terms of the disparities in education, which were right in front of us, we could no longer deny them during COVID-19, where we were seeing schools that have able to continue and engage in their learners to learn whereas the masses were being left behind. And the question is that given the quantum of the work that needs to happen to transform education in South Africa, what do we then need to do differently moving forward in terms of how education should be resourced, in terms of which strategies should we pursue in order to bring about change. We cannot continue as we were continuing pre-COVID-19. We knew that there were disparities, but we're running out of time. So we need to think about what will be our priorities given that moving forward, the resources are going to be much less. According to the latest policy brief by UNESCO, they do point out that what COVID-19 has done is that it has worsened pre-existing education disparities globally. And so South Africa will not be any different. So we are likely to see an increase in dropout rates. Learners from vulnerable communities will be the most affected. And how do we rebuild moving forward? And how do we progress better than how we have done before. So there are certain things that we're going to have to be doing differently. I think you hit the nail on the head there. There are certain things we need to do differently. And maybe that's my next question that I'll potentially pose to you, uh, Kanyesa. What do we need to do differently? Before we start addressing some of the questions that have come through on the, the app as well as the platform, a strong focus on early childhood development as well as exposure to literature. But from your perspective, Kanyesa, what should we be doing differently? Uh, thank you, Google. I think the first thing we need to look at is how we are funding education. 
and begin to explore alternative means of doing it. Um, Dr. Rampele referred to the 1% net profits that is expected of the private sector for them to spend on socioeconomic development activities. The question is, is that enough? And does it allow them a much more committed focus on improving the state of education in South Africa? That's a big question that we, are, we need to ask. And we also need to say, when we are saying that uh, education is getting significant funding, what does that mean in relation to the quantum or the scope of work that needs to be done in order to achieve transformative work. And I think we do need to separate what we need for operational day-to-day -day activities of running an education system and what is required to do development successfully. And I think once we have done that, the next stage is to then say, what is then the quantum of the problem? What is the quantum of resources that is required? How do we then raise funding in such a way that the funding that's going to be going towards that development is more stable than a current funding, uh, the, than the current way in which we are committing on a year-to-year -year basis based on how much profits we have done as, as business. So I do think that we need to take to heart and accept that an effective education system means talent pool for the private sector. Yep. It means leadership pool for the private sector. It means new markets for the private sector as more and more people get employed. So we therefore need to recognize that the commitment that we must then engage on as far as development for education does need more commitment. Indeed. You, you raise a critical point there, especially in terms of identifying the elements in terms of, of, of uh, what is it that we're looking to measure in terms of outcomes, what is it that we're allocating. And coming back to the uh, questions that have come through on the Q&A session on our platform, uh, a lot of questions being raised in terms of uh, where we were pre-COVID. And, and I, I want to draw this back to say, well, we're sourcing some solutions in terms of crafting the direction moving forward, but it is important to reflect if there are any lessons that we can learn from our past. Uh, and I'd like to direct this back to you, Sis Kulula. Um, um, uh, lots of feedback coming on uh, the uh, Q&A session, which asks, how do you justify the comment that uh, the education system was in a great space before COVID? Uh, and, and I want us to respond to that and also get your feedback in terms of how best then do we need to take from positive learnings pre-COVID and perhaps we can implement now going forward and if they might be relevant. That's also a question I'd like to uh, also draw to uh, Sis Fuyiswa in terms of understanding what was it that we did before that was working that we can take forward with us. Let's start with you, Sis Kulut. Thank you very much. Um, so, the question that is asking with how we justify that we were in a great space. Um, I wouldn't think that we were in a great space, but we were definitely not where we are today, post COVID. We were on an upward trajectory. Mm -hmm. we, we, we had, just had the results of PALS, um, uh, the study um, that is taken by grade fours, which showed us that our children were not able to read uh, uh, for meaning and they were not reading uh, uh, as um, uh, and meeting the international benchmarks mm -hmm. of, 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 of making meaning with what they read. Um, and so post that, post the receipt of results of PALS, we started implementing a lot of initiatives and uh, we started to look at what makes for reading for meaning, mm -hmm. what programs and that should be designed that would actually take us to, 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 to that point where we want to see that our children, particularly 10 year olds, can read for meaning. For instance, we implemented a lot of programs. I'm going to make an example of um, early grade reading study. We took a study uh, which showed us that to strengthen that, we have to ensure that there are the right resources. Those resources are mediated by a competent teacher 
And when that teacher is mediating in terms of the strategies that the teacher would be using, for instance, there has to be an emphasis on in-classroom support, uh, where we then started uh, looking and conceptualizing uh, how to bring in coaches into the, into the education space uh -huh. uh, to support the teachers and to support the support advisors. Um, we, we went out on a call to, to, to business, to society, to, to ask them to work with us and we established the National Reading Coalition which is a coalition of all the willing partners who have the same goal. We share the same aspiration of really taking our children on this positive trajectory where they can be able to read and write and count and we have seen those paying off. I, I want to draw this to, to the comment that uh, Sis Vuyiso also shared with us earlier mm -hmm. that uh, despite small successes that you allude to, as, as you correctly do, uh, it does appear to be fairly isolated. Um, uh, Vuyiso did allude to the fact that resources aren't shared and spread adequately and evenly across the country, that uh, labor, uh, teachers to a certain extent, don't always work in the best interests of, of students. So uh, I guess how I'm trying to tie this into to, to this particular statement is what is it that worked within those particular spheres of success that we can now look back to and now try to scale in order to ensure that uh, we avoid more of the challenges that we had pre-COVID? It's what we had discovered to be, to be one of the, of, the, of the issues that take from progress. It's that working in silos, operating in these small corners, having these small pockets of excellence here, which is why we called on all role players in the space to get involved and form a coalition. Because with that coalition, you get to understand if there are duplications, you get to share resources, so you maximize on the investment. Mm -hmm. And you, if you, because what we discovered was that there were instances where a particular a partner of ours would then converge on this very same corner of school, and the, very, the next one would come to the very same school and give resources when there are other areas that have been actually left dry without any of those resources. Makes so sense. collaboration is what we are really, really hopping on, to say join hands with us, because once we join hands, we then get to have a shared understanding of the problem, uh, its depth, and how it manifests. And we are able together to actually arrive at a kind of a framework of, 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 of a common purpose of, yes. and aligning those purposes in terms of how we can resolve those issues. Issues of, 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 of resources uh, that do not stretch far enough. Mm -hmm. We are government, yes, but we have our own um, uh, challenges in terms of being able to provide every learner with a book. We do it with workbooks. Every learner has a workbook, but we know that workbooks are just workbooks. Sure. We need more, way more than that. And we have willing South Africans in the form of, of business, in the form of just ordinary South Africans who want to get involved. So we didn't have a platform before. Now we do have a platform. Indeed. I want to build up on that element of collaboration and uh, Sis Vuyiswa, well, bring this back to you for a moment because collaboration is right up your alley as the CEO of Bridge. You bring together uh, innovators, uh, individuals within the public sector, the private sector as well, in order to capitalize uh, on this particular growth. On the back of what has been mentioned by Sis Kulula, uh, how, how best then can we actually expand on, on these sweet spots that have been happening in silos uh, mm. and bringing them to scale? Uh, is collaboration working and are we collaborating on the right aspect? Uh, from your observations, how best do we need to uh, um, ensure that this becomes more fruitful than what it was in the past? So one of the amazing things that have happened as a result of COVID-19 is a stronger relationship between civil society, funders and government. So I represent the National Association of Social Change Entities in Education. And social change entities is a fancy word for NGOs. So um, as part of accountability and building trust with stakeholders, we have seen how the Department of Basic Education has taken leadership seriously. So since the beginning of COVID-19, we had about seven meetings where government has shared their plans and they also opened up and we have been honest about where they have shortcomings 
and that has enabled uh, some of our members as NASCI, uh, which are NGOs, to think through how they can galvanize support from the private sector to get some of the programs that are sorely needed funded uh, at school levels. So while um, COVID-19 has had a devastating effect, it's all opened up other avenues where different stakeholders are able to work with government and do some system strengthening work and catalyze private sector funding to support our schools. Um, so I would say we need to do more of that, but um, be very clear about the roles and responsibilities mm. and who does what, because the reality is that uh, we have a trust deficit and not just in education. So a lot of these partnerships have to build trust in order for all of us to know what we don't know, to begin to come up with strategies education. So if you look at the private sector, I mean, 10 billion rands is a lot of money, but it's a drop in the ocean when you consider the resources of government. So we work in a way that strengthens the system but also unlocks money so that we're not working in silos, we're not duplicating resources, but we're also sharing knowledge. Uh, in closure, collaborative partnerships are key to educational change. I'm glad you highlight that uh, as it does come up as one of the key questions that has uh, come up from, from the uh, chat service that we have here. But I do want to uh, uh, also get your thoughts here, um, uh, Sis Kangis, uh, in terms of uh, how we can actually embark on this collaborative effort in, in a more measurable outcomes and in a better way, uh, particularly uh, in terms of understanding how business is, is maybe focusing on, on new elements of, of uh, the education landscape, uh, being ECD or maybe the more uh, um, high and more established years of education that might take place. How is Old Mutual approaching this and the ongoing conversations in terms of increased collaboration? Um, that's for you, Sis uh, Kanyesa Diamond. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Google. I think for us, we are also focusing on finding partnerships. Um, first of all, the partnerships will need to be with government, the Department of Basic Education, in understanding what is the strategy moving forward? What are the focus area that needs support? And so how do we then leverage what they're already doing and to bring about resources to support that? So partnerships with, uh, with, with government are going to be, to be key. But not only that, I think as the private sector, we need to galvanize each other so if we have a partnership and we have a relationship with another private sector, um, Standard Bank with, with NetBank or with, with a, a cash belt, we bring various resources. So let's encourage each other to collaborate and work with each other in partnership with government so that we do not duplicate resources um, and what you sometimes find that is that as well, because we're pursuing our own strategies, there's a concentration of funds go going towards a particular area at the expense of neglecting other equally important areas. So and that, uh, 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 we could be all doing maths and science, we could all be doing leadership and, and, and development, meanwhile, you know, um, infrastructure gets neglected in, in, in the process. So I do think that we need to go back to the drawing board as a collective and drive education and what needs to be achieved and what needs to be transformed in unison rather than as different singular organizations that are pursuing their own strategies. So for us as all mutual, we are looking for partnerships and definitely moving forward, any of our CSI and corporate social responsibility strategies that we're going to be pursuing moving forward, none of them are done without consulting and understanding the direction that uh, government is moving forward or towards. 
Kangisa, you mentioned the drawing board. I want to take it to the chalkboard for a moment. There's a lot of activity happening in the chat as well as the Q&A regarding teachers uh, and has, has been highlighted uh, by Vuyiswa. Uh, there, there, there's a strong level of concern regarding uh, the, the labor force and their level of commitment to educating our children adequately within uh, the, the fundamental space. I'd like to throw this to you, Sis Kulula, and then Vuyiswa, I'm happy for you to jump in as well if you've got any feedback. Uh, in terms of how we ensure that we have them fully on board, not only to be part of this digital migration and, and a new way of uh, learning and skills development, but making sure that they are, are fully committed and invested um, um, in terms of education. What are the conversations that are taking place um, from uh, DBE? And maybe, Vuiswa, you can also share some feedback as to what some of the concerns are that have been raised in that regard. Um, are you referring to teachers? or to, Teachers specifically. Right. Teachers specifically. Okay. Um, and only directing this at you because I do understand, I understand. that naturally there would be a tra relationship um, between labor, the conversations that take place um, with school teachers uh, and the de Department of Basic Education. Um, you are actually asking this question. Um, um, we are meeting here in October, which is a teacher month. In the t it's a teacher appreciation month. There is um, a lot of good that our teachers are actually bringing into, the, into, into their profession. Um, there are perceptions out there that teachers are, 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 they do not want to work or they do not know what they are doing. We wouldn't say that we do not have challenges of capacity with some of the teachers, uh, but it is, really does not describe the, the entire teacher force it, that we have in South Africa. Uh, we have willing teachers who take up their, their, their professional development very seriously. But now what do we do as a system to support them? What are the institutional mechanisms that we put in place? Uh, as a system, we have categorized professional development as one of the most important um, avenues that we should take to support our teachers. And in so doing, we ensure that the courses that we provide our teachers are courses that are endorsed we have a body that is says that uh, uh, the council for educators that ensures that teachers who must participate in professional development uh, which is some of that is self-driven and is that i was about to say yes. is that something that everybody has a buy-in into regardless it, of ages and where they stand absolutely. in the generational path where they stand in the generational path as uh, so when we say they are they are they are assets it's not a slogan mm -hmm. We really invest in them, and so some of that is, 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 is self-driven, and some of that is uh, driven by needs that uh, those who provide those services to teachers pick up those needs. So teachers um, uh, go through self-reflection tools where they get to understand where they are in terms of their own uh, growth towards towards mastery of, 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 of content and mastery of pedagogy. Mm -hmm. Where there are challenges, we are able to use those reports and we are able to then provide them with the kind of professional development that they need. What uh, has been the biggest frustration from teachers that you've heard during this uh, time of lockdown? During the time of lockdown, the teachers have not been able to work with their children, to access their children as much as our children couldn't access the teachers, mm -hmm. teachers couldn't access the children because we have the, 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 digital, the, the digital divide has been one of those issues that has actually made it difficult for our teachers to be able to continue to do what they would have loved to do. Yes. I had said before, COVID was an eye-opener. Yes. And it has really launched us into understanding that the world has changed. We live in a technologically driven world. And, and how does that then uh, impact on them and, and, and how they deliver their services in the future, mm -hmm. now and post-COVID? Mm -hmm. and, and so we had already started implementing digital learning programs with our teachers uh, to say that, yes, the device is there, it helps you, but it is about learning and how you use this device yes. to deliver quality education. So we have a framework for digital learning, which we are taking our teachers through. It's something that we are doing pre-COVID. And sense. in terms of availing devices, actually, even uh, in 2019, one of the, of, the, of the commitments that we made which came through also from, from, from the State of the Nation address is the provision of digital tools and resources for our learners, le including those learners who are marginalized, who are in special schools. And that's where we are starting 
to actually deliver these, 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 these digital tools and resources so that we can provide a kind of a blended uh, a, a kind of a, of, of a learning service mm -hmm. to our learners. Vuiso, I'd like to draw this one to you to uh, hear some of your insights. I've, we've mentioned chalkboard and we've gone to uh, digital tools. So it just shows you the kind of shift that's taken place for educators here uh, within the South African environment. But what's your experience been like? Uh, and I also ask this, bearing in mind that we might be seated here in Johannesburg and many other urban areas across the country, but uh, the situation is very different when you go out to uh, uh, more rural areas of South Africa's uh, education force. Are, are you finding new ways to get the buy-in of educators, um, whether it's through a chalkboard or digital tools, what incentives uh, and conversations are you having in terms of getting their buy-in and shifting their mindset to prioritize learning again? Um, so our strategic thrust as Bridge is to convene communities of practice. And that's what in DBE circles are known as professional learning communities. So we are finding that teachers do want to use technology, but there's a lot of fear. And um, so, so it feels like you're building the plane as you're flying. Um, through COVID or during COVID, we've also seen how many teachers were also taking ownership of the narrative mm -hmm. and wanted to evaluate themselves if I can remember one of the surveys that uh, some of the major unions did in May, uh, they went out to their colleagues just to get a sense of how much work uh, has been happening during the hard lockdowns. A large percentage of that survey, like 51%, they indicated that they couldn't communicate with most of their learners. Mm. Now, um, well-to-do affluent schools continued to teach during lockdown, but the bulk of African children weren't able to access learning. But the great thing about those surveys that were led by uh, teacher unions was that they were using their own agency to measure the quantum of the challenges. So if you have uh, 51% of the teachers not communicating. It highlights a huge uh, gap and an inequity that uh, not just government should uh, resolve, but it highlights an area where the private sector could partner with government to bring in a lot of training uh, workshops that fast track um, how teachers use technology, because we can't go back to the chalkboard. We talk a lot about the fourth industrial revolution, but I do feel that in many cases, it's rhetoric because you're talking, people who don't know anything about technology or know very little are at the forefront of leading those uh, campaigns, which is obviously not the right way to do it. And I mean, as adults, we, we know that our children are often leading in technology. So we have to come up with strategies that encourage uh, self-directed learning by our children. And we, we do have research that shows uh, in many instances and countries where private sector avails computers to kids, they often lead the adults. So, um, there is a need, again, to not just tackle those issues as one uh, stakeholder, but to look at what's possible by the private sector. But it's going to require honesty so that um, the Department of Basic Education and by extension teachers do acknowledge what they don't know. But we find that with older teachers, it's often very difficult for them to admit that they don't know how to use uh, devices. And we, although um, as Bridge and other partners, uh, we have been embarking on assisting not just principals, but HODs to use the data-driven dashboards. And once they get it, they do use data and technology to improve the quality of their decision making. But that starts with a, with a sense of, of self-awareness so that they know what they don't know 
and they go out uh, to galvanize support from others who can assist schools to use technology better. I'm glad you highlight that. Uh, looking at some of the comments and the feedback coming through on the chat, uh, a lot of conversations in terms of uh, uh, using digital tools, if they might be appropriate for early childhood development. And uh, I understand uh, multi-sensory teaching is actually more uh, encouraged, particularly in that department. Uh, and of course, uh, the conversations around uh, the other elements that contribute to digital learning uh, or online tools being available, uh, which speaks to data. And of course, prioritizing uh, and understanding the difference between online learning and learning online, which I understand are two separate contracts, cons constructs as well that, that influence the landscape. But I do want us to shift to another theme that has come up quite uh, significantly when it comes to the uh, uh, um, question and answer session from the audience members, and that speaks to early childhood development. Uh, and taking this back to you, Kanisa, you highlighted earlier that the outlook does not look too positive in terms of additional capital that will be allocated to education going forward. Uh, and of course, that does also speak to a potential increase in dropout rates. Looking at the facts and figures, it is well documented, as Sis Kulula mentioned, uh, the uh, level and the spike in the dropout rate that takes place from uh, grade one to grade 12 uh, in South Africa as there is a fall off of students along the way. As we focus on early childhood development, it appears to be, uh, as the questions say, ignored, but yet still presents a great opportunity for us to reevaluate how we approach this. Um, Sis Kangisa, I'm keen to hear your thoughts here in terms of uh, early childhood development, um, if that has been a focus for Old Mutual, or if this does provide an opportunity for us to review how it is that we approach ECD. Uh, and uh, Sis Kulula, happy to bring this to you back as well here in studio in terms of getting your questions and thoughts around how best we capitalize on the opportunities uh, and the risks that's presented by ECD as that dropout rate could just be exacerbated and double in the years to come. Sis Kanyesa, let's start with you. Uh, thank you, Kuku. Early childhood development is, for me, a key lever that guarantees us whether our children are going to fare well at school, particularly starting from grade one and up. So it, it provides them with fundamental skills and, and, and proper foundation to be able to deal with the curriculum from grade one and, and, and in later years. So it's, it's very important. And I think in South Africa, uh, only in 2022 will grade R, for example, be made compulsory. And we've always seen that the difference between the children who come from affluent families and those who do come from poor communities is that those who come from affluent families would have had about at least more than two years of learning happening in a formalized institution before they start with grade one, something that is not similarly found in other communities within our our country. And so what that does is that by the time that children who come from poor communities start school, there's already disparities. So it is an area that needs that needs attention. Um, we do need to get to a point of, of, of again, um, agreeing on what is the provision of any childhood development looking like from the various stages of development for children. Um, and what are we not providing appropriately and what do we then need to do to respond to that? In terms of all mutual for our new strategy moving forward, which is starting in 2021 up to 2025 for the next five years, early childhood development is definitely going to be a focus area, particularly focusing in the last two years of it before they start school. So that would be the ages between five and six. And the idea there is for us to focus on building emergent literacy and numeracy so that when kids start in grade one, they fare better and at least they don't start from zero. Um, and, the, and the teachers can begin that learning journey from a point as opposed to, um, to absolutely no, no, no start at all. So I think that would be that would be my my response. But we haven't agreed in the provision of that and what it looks like. Again, we're seeing various models across across the board. Makes a lot of sense. So Skulula, if you have feedback very briefly, we've literally got 15 seconds Lovely. in terms of uh, uh, early childhood development. Um, I 
we're just going to say that then the, the opportunity is actually now yes. for, 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 for collaboration to be actually heightened in this space. Uh, the, the sixth administration has taken a very, very big decision to, to, to migrate ECD uh, from, from, from social development to, 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 to the Department of Basic Education uh, so that we can have a kind of a comprehensive approach to the development of, of, of those young ones. And so we are at a space where we are scoping what it's going to look like. Uh, we are looking at once that sh a function shifts over to us, we are then going to be starting to providing um, 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 education in terms of equality Education. Yes. So, opportunity for collaboration. So, if Kanyesa is saying that um, Old Michelle is, is actually thinking of, of, of looking and prioritizing uh, ECD, it is our priority now. There's a conversation that can certainly happen. It has to be had. There's a conversation that has to be had. Thank you and so much. The time is now. Indeed, the time is now. The time is now. Indeed. I'd like to thank my panelists and guests for joining us for this conversation. As has been highlighted, the situation is quite concerning and does need uh, clear uh, attention to be paid by all stakeholders in terms of uh, sourcing potential solutions. The solutions will not work for all stakeholders across the complete landscape of South Africa, but it's exactly where we need to find unique nuances in terms of our collaborative efforts and understanding the roles and responsibilities of each stakeholder that will really help us deliver results. But as has been mentioned, the time is now and we need to certainly implement now. I'd like to thank my panelists for joining us, uh, both virtually. That would be Usis Fuiswang Ngonsa. She's the CEO of Bridge. Also joined by Kangisa Diamond, Head of Education at Old Mutual Foundation. And in studio, joined by Usis Kulula Manona, Director of Reading Promotion at the National Department of Basic Education. Thank you, ladies, for joining us for this conversation. We appreciate your feedback and insight that you've shared here today. Well, we're getting quite excited with this conversation, and we're glad that you are, too, in terms of the feedback that we've been monitoring from the uh, chat services as well as the Q&A session, and we ask that you keep that momentum going, interacting with each other as you uh, share some feedback on critical questions. But we've come to the part of the program where we are going to move into breakaway sessions, and this does allow us the opportunity to uh, focus on key aspects of a uh, broader discussion of education that we can highlight on. Now, I see some of you have already got very quick thumbs and you've uh, responded to our polls. Uh, there is a very quick poll question in terms of highlighting uh, the breakaway sessions we have. And we asked you which breakaway session you will be attending, which starts now, just before lunch. Uh, and uh, the results that have come in so far, 75% uh, of you saying collaboration in education. On the back of the conversation we've just had, I think it's quite clear how that's coming in. 64% of you, so those numbers changing slightly. Keep pressing, keep punching, they'll keep updating. But of course, the other two breakaway rooms that we have available for you, literacy, the key to quality education, and early childhood development, the building blocks for long life learning. So 12% there, but a large majority of you focusing on collaboration in education. Well, those will both be held on this platform and you can find your way to the specific conversation that you you'd like to participate in but do be mindful of coming back to this particular main room and main feed where we will be giving away prizes and uh, asking you specific questions and interacting with you uh, once the breakaway sessions are done before lunch for the moment though ladies and gentlemen we'd like to cross over to our breakaway sessions which will be taking place in shortly